Hello and welcome back to the From My Perspective podcast where I, Jackson McCarty, tell you all the names you need to know in the college football and NFL landscapes that could be changing the football landscape in the very near future. So last time I was sitting in front of the camera talking to you guys, it was because Arch Manning made maybe the biggest decision of his life to this point and decided to go to the University of Texas. We talked a little bit more about what that means for not just Texas, the entirety of college football. And that was, since that was breaking news, you know, there was less um, planning that went into it, less general, I, I guess, where I have to be super creative. It's more just my opinion on things. This is pure creativity because there is no, uh, there's no substance to any of these being true. It's just things that I find interesting and hopefully you do the same. So what we'll be talking about today is picking five schools that either need a fresh face in the building or need a reboot in terms of just how their program is going as a whole. And we're putting new head coaches in those spots. It's five total teams. Uh, only three of those, though, currently coach in college football. And you'll see what I mean, and it won't even take long, because number five is somebody who is not currently a coach. They are still involved in college football. But it's Chris Peterson, and I would love to see him go to Vanderbilt. So what is Vanderbilt known for, besides being, the, to, more often than not, the worst team in the SEC? They're known for being the smartest school in the Southeast Conference. And if they could just really lean into that academic standing and just say, you know what? Yeah, we are essentially the nerds of the SEC. Why don't we get somebody who's a super duper brainiac with football like Chris Peterson is, who has proven time and time again while he was in the Mountain West and Pac-12 um, that he is a super smart head coach. And while, yes, he is taking a backseat role right now, he's in some form of advisory role with Washington, of course, most notably from Boise State and was there for a pretty long time. But altogether, I think that he stands out as, as far as guys who I could see going to Vanderbilt and people that, uh, like Nick Saban, obviously a very smart head coach, but he's not going to Vanderbilt. And I don't really think that matches, especially with you know, just what we consider them to be and how we consider him to be Alabama at this point, Bill Belichick. It, it, you know, I tried to keep these somewhere in the in the semblance of realism. I didn't want to just, you know, mix and match and be like, oh, you'll get, uh, you know, Mike Tomlin to lead Vanderbilt. It, that, that's not how I wanted to do things. So Chris Peterson is a, what I would consider a somewhat realistic option if he did want to get back into coaching. Obviously, he is in that advisory role now. But if they were to really lean into that fact that they are just significantly smarter um, across the board than most, if not all, SEC schools by a significant margin, or they are the smartest team in the SEC, but uh, I want to say there was another school or two within like 20 to 30 ranks um, because they're like a top 20 school as far as education goes in Division One period. So it's interesting to see. It, or it would be more interesting to see, rather, them really just go headfirst into that and say, yes, this is how we're going to do things. Uh, sorry, that's just, that's the way we're doing it. And we're going to really bend into that identity. So that is number five. And I believe it's the only SEC team, if I'm remembering correctly, that features on this list. But since it is not a, a super prestigious school as far as on the field goes. I did want to start them off first. A team that has absolutely been prestigious in the past, maybe not recently, um, on the football field is Florida State, who uh, they just re-signed Norvell to an, an extension, and you know they seem like that's what the way they want to go. They seem like that's their guy, but um, you have Deion Sanders. Deion Sanders is right there, and I know I'm pouring salt in the wounds and. Part of that is why I'm choosing Deion Sanders to do that, and that's why I'm bringing up Florida State, because you really, you're really you just letting him sift through your fingers. He is right there. You could have had Deion Sanders last year. Absolutely. You probably would get Travis Hunter if you would have done that, a, a five-star recruit who is now going to Jackson State and flipped from Florida State. Um, it, there's so much going on with Jackson State right now, which is where Dion coaches currently, if you're not already aware of that. Um, that is, there's so much to enjoy. For example, let's look at the overall recruitment and transfer rankings. Florida State University is 19th. You know, that's that's pretty good, especially for a, a big state, a former powerhouse program in a Power 5 conference. You know, you'll 19's not 
you know, just blowing the doors off of anything. But it's pretty impressive, right? Well, Jackson State was 74th, and they are an FCS school. Think about that for a second. They are in the top 75 of all college football programs as far as ranking and transfers go. I believe they ended up with like three or four four-star recruits, and obviously Travis Hunter is a five-star. Just between those two, I know they got that kid from A&M who got bumped up to a four-star in his transfer portal. It's incredible what he is doing, and you can see a lot of it is being founded upon the energy that he is bringing into Jackson State, something that Florida State does not have right now. I can't honestly look at the program and genuinely believe that, hey, um, you know, the energy is great here. Maybe it'll turn itself around. I can't sit here and do that. That's not something that I personally see with this Florida State team. And to be honest, adding that extension for Norvell felt almost hollow. Like, it felt like they was trying to boost morale, in a sense, more than it did that they actually wanted to stay committed to him. He's been here for two years, and he's been sub-500 both years. Again, it takes a minute to build a program, but if you stay at five wins next year or lower, God help, um, I, I don't see a reason to stick with it. And I, that's not even because I think Norvell's a bad coach. It's just that you have Dion, And you know what Florida State needs? Florida State needs an identity again, and they need somebody in charge that knows what it means to be a Seminole when the Seminoles are great. It, who fits that better than Deion Sanders? You know, you're not going to get Jameis Winston to come be your head coach. You're not, you're not going to get any of these other legends more likely than not. You've got Deion Sanders, who is already proving that, for one, he can recruit the lights out of the building, and for two, he just fielded like an 11-1 team last year with his kid being the quarterback, and now he's going to have Travis Hunter to throw the ball. I whoever lands Dion, whether it is Florida State, which I think it probably should be, just to make the the story that the storybook fairy tale ending come together. Um, but if they don't, and he leaves in a year or two, Travis Hunter's coming with him. I would imagine a lot of his standout players are coming with him. Think about what happened with Lincoln Riley, um, and now he's got the talent where that's not laughable. You know, it's not like he's bringing you know these one and two star kids that had 60 tackles in FCS. He's bringing guys who these major programs were chasing after for the entirety of recruitment. So that's something that you should really think about if you're a Florida State fan or if you're in charge of Florida State because you've got a guy who knows what that identity means, not only as a player, but to Tallahassee, to Florida, to college football, and you better not let him slip through and let him just – make somebody else's program that much better. Um, so, obviously, Deion Sanders, again, knows what it's like to be a Florida State Seminole. Somebody else who knows what it's like to be a different coach is Chip Kelly and the Oregon Ducks. He knows exactly what it's like to be the head coach of that program, and they just had an opening, and there was a part of me that believed that this was actually going to happen. I'm putting Chip Kelly back to Oregon strictly because when I think of Oregon, I think of Chip Kelly. I think of his offenses. I think of his. Um, I think of the st the record he brought in the uniforms and the glitz and the glamour. Something you wouldn't consider for Eugene, Oregon. That's what I thought of Chip Kelly as, and that's what I thought of Oregon as. And I mean, after all, he's right down the road. You're gonna see him in the Pac-12, anyways. Why not bring him back? You know, and I like Dan Lanning. I, I don't know that it was a home run hire, but I think it was a, a solid double. But Chip Kelly defines the the most memorable part of this golden age of Oregon Ducks football, at least to me. I, you know, if you started watching college football earlier than I did, or you started watching, you know, however earlier or whatever, you maybe maybe that's not how it is to you. But Chip Kelly, if you say Oregon Ducks, that's who I think of. I think of that high tempo offense, that high velocity with the Nike uniforms and the, I mean, just everything. And it worked so well. And ultimately, they're at a crossroads because they have to now find what's next after Mario Cristobal, who did them very well for a number of years. But sometimes what's next doesn't always have to be something new. What's next could just as functionally have been, let's call Chip Kelly. Let's get him back in the building. And I think that where the program is at now, he could have just as easily picked up where he left off and built something again 
and kept a lot of those pieces together. Maybe you even get a lot of UCLA transfers over, like Dorian Thompson Robinson and those players. I, I was going to say Kyle Phillips, but he just went to the NFL. So there's there's just so much that you could have done with that. And sure, UCLA fans would probably be mad at you. And sure, it's going to feel a little bit weird to start with. But once he gets settled in and you start remembering what it's like uh, to have him in the building, I just I don't see a reason that that you wouldn't pull the trigger on it. I really don't. So that makes for number three on the list. That is Oregon Ducks bringing back Chip Kelly. So far, the list has been fairly wide. I would say I would say it's been pretty spread out, pretty balanced um, as far as you know, getting a guy who used to be there, somebody as a player, as a coach, uh, somebody who's never even touched the Vanderbilt program. Now we have somebody who was, again, an alumni, but has never coached this program. And I don't know that they've that he's ever crossed paths with this program um, while he was coaching elsewhere. This guy is currently an NFL coach, uh, somebody who, or the most recent, other no, the one before Urban Meyer was the most recent to make the jump to the NFL from the college football level. We're talking about Matt Rule, and I'm talking about Penn State. Penn State, and I know they love they love James Franklin, and I get that. You know, that's it's a stable face that has been there for some pretty good moments of Penn State football. That's all fine. Matt Rule is about to flame out of the NFL, and knowing what we know about him as a college football coach, I think he'd get rid of James Franklin to get Matt Rule back if he's going to be the guy who was leading Baylor and was leading Temple to success far beyond they realistically should have had. Matt Rule returning to his alma mater to revamp a program that currently doesn't look awesome following those back-to-back four, four and five years. Um, that would it, it sounds great to me, especially if they do it again, you know, another four or five win season. Um, Rule built his reputation on putting energy into the heart of programs that were behind larger giants at this point. And while he, obviously, yes, Penn State is monstrous as far as uh, fan base and you know, the atmosphere and everything. But when it comes down to talent and it comes down to results, you are at best third, at absolute best. And I would argue you could be as low as fifth, maybe even sixth. You know, I don't have the list right in front of me, but I know you've got Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, Wisconsin immediately. And, you know, not trying to run through the entire list of my brain, but right there, that's four teams that I think you could argue are comfortably in front of Penn State right now. So while, yes, it's hard to say goodbye to a coach that has been there for a lot of good things in James Franklin, I think if Matt Rule gets the boot at the end of the season, he's no longer the head coach of the Carolina Panthers, and James Franklin underperforms yet again, I think I, I would love to see it, and I would genuinely be interested in how everything unfolds with Matt Rule coming back to college football because I would imagine it would still be pretty impressive and it could almost be like how Nick Saban was whenever he jumped down. I don't think he'll turn Penn State into Alabama, but he could turn them back into something that we've long since recognized as being a major program. And at the end of the day, that's what's best for college football. Speaking of what's best for college football, Texas football, the Longhorns, you know them, the Orange, um, they, I'm not sure about Steve Sarkeesian. I'm not. There's there's no part of me that wants to go out on a limb and say that he is the, the savior and the guy that's going to get them over the hump. I get they have Archie Manning, but sometimes coaches can fail players. It's just how it happens. And also, we maybe Arch Manning isn't what we think he is. And, you know, we, we've spent all this time being so excited about Arch Manning coming to the league and continuing that last name and doing everything, but if he's not if he's not that guy, he's not that guy. So, and the, the same logic applies to Steve Sarkeesian. So if they decide in a year's time, in two years' time, maybe in three years' time, depending, there are some things that, uh, with the head coach I'm about to say, that could, could mess things up here. But if they do decide that they need to get rid of Steve Sarkeesian and they need to move in a new direction, I would pick Lane Kiffin. And I know that the idea is not the most um, exciting or welcome thing for a lot of fans. I would imagine a lot of Texas fans are not in on this idea. 
but let me explain it a little bit more. Both are very divisive. You love them or you hate them. A lot of people don't like you. Um, they were, they're always under the spotlight and they're defined by their past right now. I don't think anybody's defining Texas football by what they are currently. Um, when you think of Texas football, you do not think of what they fielded last year. You don't think of Casey Thompson. Um, there's the brand is built purely in what they used to be. And Lane Kiffin now following his USC issues where he got offloaded and now he's back at, or whenever he went back to Bama and then went to FAU and now he's an old miss. Um, he's built his way back up, which is a, a lot more than most coaches who fail out in these big programs can say. I think that shows a lot about his resiliency and, Another, you know, key aspect of this and showing what he has learned, look at what Old Miss is doing right now. I mean, they, as a program, I wouldn't, they don't have the recruiting base of Louisiana, Florida, Georgia, Bama, Auburn. Um, you know, they don't have that, that level, Tennessee. They don't have that. They don't. But he's still finding a way to win. And even with everybody leaving this past year, they might still become a seven-win team, eight-win team, whatever they fall into, just because he managed to get a quarterback in Jackson Dart out there who was seen as phenomenal coming out of high school. He's willing to go from Southern California to Oxford for a coach, essentially, because I don't think you're going to Oxford for the scenery or the weather. You're going because you feel confident in the guy who just pitched to you, and Lane Kiffin just so happens to be that guy. And obviously, again, the, the USC stuff will scare people off. It has ruined the opinion on Lane Kiffin of, for a lot of people. But to show that ability to say, you know what, I'm going to take the back, back seat to Nick Saban, learn what I can for a few years, then I'm going to go down to Florida Atlantic build a little something out there, and then I'm going to go to Ole Miss and now look like a pretty solid program, and he's doing a lot to be involved with the school. The come-to-the-sip stuff is, I think, brilliant um, as far as really buying in and making recruiting a social media campaign, which is a lot of understanding who you're talking to anymore with, with a lot of these recruits because, you know, what do they care about the past? But if they see stuff coming up on, on Twitter and Instagram, come to the SIP and this and that, you, you get them hooked. Now, if you'll remember, before I started this, I mentioned that there could be something that throws a little bit of a wrinkle into it. Um, I somewhat believe that Lane Kiffin will be the Alabama replacement if Nick Saban leaves and Dabo Sweeney um, is struggling at Clemson because, you know, if he still can't string together a few great seasons, you're going to be like, okay, so he's nothing without Deshaun Watson, Trevor Lawrence, and it's a natural way of thinking. So I could see Lane Kiffin going there, but if Texas does need a head coach in the foreseeable future without Lane Kiffin making the jump to Bama, I could see, I could see it and I think it'd be a good fit. So what do you think about those five coaches? Do you think the, the list was awful? Do you hate it? Do you have some different ideas? Did I help spawn some of those for you? Or do you absolutely love it? Feel free to leave it in the comments below or send it to my Twitter, both of which will be in the description. But for now, that is episode 13 of the From My Perspective podcast. And as always, I'll see you next time.